The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the price of gold was down another $15 or so today. It was a new low, a new six-year low. I think gold settled around $1,053 an ounce. The selling began early this morning following the release of a better-than-expected job report from ADP. Remember, this is private payrolls, and we always get this report a couple of days before we get the official government non-farm payroll number, which is coming out on Friday. Now, if you remember, last month, they reported 182,000 jobs for ADP, and that was below uh, what the estimate was. Uh, but then we got the better than expected, what, 270 what, some odd thousand jobs uh, from the government. This time, the ADP number came out at 217,000 versus expectations of 183. And in fact, they revised up last month's 182 to 196. But really, I mean, 217,000 jobs when you're expecting 183,000. I mean, really, not much of a big deal, especially when they're really trying to catch up uh, because this number was way below what the government estimate was. And so maybe they caught up a little bit. It's still significantly below, I guess, uh, what the official government number was for the month of October. Uh, but, you know, it's not that big a deal for gold to have immediately sold off about $10, you know, within seconds of this report uh, being released, this better than expected report. And again, this number, ADP, so far they've had eight misses this year out of all the, the 12 you know months of the year that we've got these ADP reports. Eight of the 12 have been below estimates. So the, the number has missed estimates twice as many times as it's beat them. Uh, yet somehow this shows, oh, the economy is really strong, the Fed's going to raise rates. Um, and the price of gold dropped, even though everybody already believes the Fed's going to raise rates anyway. Somehow this ad additional evidence uh, caused gold prices to drop. You know, by the way, hedge funds are the most short they've ever been in gold ever right now. The least long, the most short, their net short position. Obviously, everybody who's short gold right now, if you shorted it over the last few years, you're ahead, right? That trade is a winner for everybody. But we'll see what happens if the price of gold reverses uh, between now and the end of the year and we get a lot of hedge funds that want to book those profits. We'll see how, uh, how much profits remain to be booked if a lot of the shorts at once decide to cover because I think a lot of people sitting on paper profits are going to find those paper profits very difficult to realize when everybody is trying to realize them at the same time uh, when there is a change in information. Meanwhile, in the real world, in the physical world, the demand for gold continues to hit records um, as we're getting reports of, uh, you know, the, from the mints about what demand is for actual physical uh, silver and gold coins. You know, the people who are buying and selling in the futures markets, which really accounts for 98, 99 percent of all the volume. Right. This is people uh, who's selling gold who don't have it. And the buyers don't actually want delivery, right? So people who don't have gold sell it to people who don't actually want it, and that's 98, 99% of the market. But in the real market, for people who actually want gold, buying it from people who actually have the gold to sell, there you see uh, incredible demand uh, to buy it, while the speculators, all the demand is on the short side. What's really interesting, though, to me, is the different type of reaction that we get when we get good news, theoretically, right? The ADP report is good news in that it was a stronger jobs creation, right? So, oh, the economy is good. And there's an immediate reaction in the precious metals market and in the dollar. The dollar really spiked up across the board uh, when that ADP report came out. Uh, now, the dollar surrendered a good chunk of those gains later in the day, uh, but it still was positive on the day. Dollar index up above 100. You know, the Europeans making more noise about the fact that inflation isn't high enough. You know, an inflation number just came out in the eurozone that was one tenth of one percent lower than what people expected. And all of a sudden, aha, you know, we need more inflation. So that also uh, was supportive of the dollar. But it, it, it really got another boost 
by the the ADP number. Yet when we get negative numbers, uh, the market seems to brush it off. Like yesterday, we got a lot of negative information. First, the, the PMI number came out for November. And even though it was slightly better than expected, right, it was supposed to decline from 54.1 to 52.6. It declined to 52.8, but that's still a two-year low, right? The direction is still down, even though we didn't quite lose as much as had been anticipated. It's bad news. But where it went from bad to horrific was when we got the ISM number for November. This was at 50.1 in October. And 50.1 shows the economy barely expanding, right, in manufacturing. I mean, that's the you know, lowest you could be and still be, you know, positive. And the expectation was for an improvement in November to 50.5. Not a big improvement, but a small improvement. The actual number was 48.6. Huge drop, the biggest drop in over six years, the lowest level I since I think since March of 2009. Right? You're going back into the heart of the Great uh, Recession to find a ISM manufacturing number as low as the one we just got yesterday. So horrible news. I mean, it really confirms that the um, manufacturing sector of the U.S. economy is in recession already, right? And no one cared. There was no reaction at all. I was watching the gold market, the currency markets when this number came out. And, you know, as far as they're concerned, it's a non-event, right? Doesn't even matter. And this news was much more bad than the ADP number was good. But it shows that no one even cares. I mean, manufacturing is supposedly such a small part of the U.S. economy, which in and of itself is a huge problem. But apparently it's so small, no one gives a damn what's going on in the manufacturing sector. But look, the last time the uh, ISM was almost this bad, it was like 2012. It was almost this low. Not quite. It was almost there. The Fed immediately launched QE3. That's what they did it, right? The economy was so weak when we got an ISM number that was better than this one, but almost as bad. And the Fed launched around a quantitative easing, right? And of course, the last time it was this bad is when they launched QE1 in, 2000, in 2009. Yet now, with the manufacturing as weak as it was, or weaker than it was when they launched QE3, and almost as weak as when they launched QE1, now supposedly the Fed is ready for a rate hike, which is absurd if you actually believe that the Fed was data dependent. How could they be even talking about raising rates with data this week? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if the Fed does raise rates in December, it proves conclusively that they were never data dependent, that that whole data dependent you know, BS, it was all just a ruse. It was part of their delay tactic. They were looking for excuses not to raise rates. And so they said they were data dependent. Because if you're really data dependent, why wait until the data is at its weakest point during the entire period on which you supposedly been depending on data and choose the weak point to raise rates? I mean, if they were data dependent, they would have raised rates years ago. But had they raised rates years ago, they would have pushed the economy into recession that much sooner. So that's why they didn't do it. But they waited so long that the economy is already going into recession on its own without any help from the Fed. If the Fed now gives it a push by raising interest rates even slightly, you know, we're going to go into recession that much quicker. And the Fed is going to look ridiculous uh, for having raised rates uh, so close to the beginning of a recession. But it seems to me that the only reason that they're going to raise them is to prove that they can and to kind of give a vote of confidence to the recovery because not raising rates uh, would you know, tip people off and let them know, hey, wait a minute, what does the Fed know that we don't know? Uh, they might be worried about something. You better believe they're worried. That's why they've, they've waited so long. And that's why they're already trying to cushion the blow of any kind of rate hike uh, by saying, oh, don't worry, you know, if we raise rates, you know, we're not going to raise them again anytime soon. We're going to be really slow uh, with raising rates and we're not going to raise them very high. They're going to stay much lower than they would normally be. I mean, all of that in and of itself 
is an indication of of a lot of concern. You know, also yesterday we got the uh, motor vehicle sales and everybody was excited about, you know, these auto numbers because we we did 18.2 million was the uh, total sales and the estimate was 18.1, right? So we beat the estimate. Although 18.2 was the same as we did in the month of October. So we just, you know, we we met uh, that. But nobody really talked about the fact that the domestic sales were slightly below last month. In fact, this is the second or third month in a row that we've seen a decline in domestic auto sales. We went from 14.5 million to 14.4 million, despite the fact that, that they're giving away the store. I mentioned this in the last podcast where, you know, GM was offering 15% cash back. If you bought a new car, there was like seventy five hundred dollars, you know, to buy to buy a fifty thousand dollar car. But this is all a product of the bubble. We shouldn't be so excited about these car sales when you got an auto bubble. And, you know, um, I saw Kramer on CNBC was asked about this, you know, and he was dismissing this idea that there's a bubble and his his critique or his proof that it wasn't a bubble. He said, look, you know, it's not like back in the housing days where people were buying three and four houses at a time. Nobody's buying three or four cars. So therefore, it's not a bubble. I mean, what an absurd statement. I mean, the reason that people were buying three or four houses and they weren't buying them at one time. They, I mean, they, they would buy they would buy them as investment properties. They didn't live in three or four houses. They lived in one. Maybe they had a vacation house, so maybe they had two. But the rest were rental properties, investment properties. I mean, they were bad investments, but people were buying houses because they thought they could make money. Nobody is buying a car. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, obviously there are people who buy rare cars as an investment, a collectible car, right? I'm talking about these new automobiles that they're rolling off the assembly lines, right? Nobody buying those cars is under the delusion that they're making an investment. Everybody knows they're spending money. Everybody knows the car is going to lose value. So why would anybody load up on them? I mean, who's going to buy three or four cars? I mean, no one has a place to park them, uh, even if they had them. And they, you know, you, you're not, that doesn't make any sense. Obviously, it's not a bubble from the perspective of the car buyer. What Jim Cramer doesn't understand is the bubble is in auto finance, right? It's the lender's. That's where the bubble is. It's extending credit to people to let them buy cars. The bubble is the buyers of the loans. That's where the speculative mania is. The idea that the borrowers can actually repay. That is where there's a bubble because they've dramatically lowered the lending criteria and people are buying cars and the loans are seven, eight years. I mean, the warranties are only three or four years. I mean, this is a very risky loan when a guy's got seven years to pay you back and the warranty is only good for four. And the fact is, why are people buying cars with such a long payment? Because they can't afford conventional financing. Normally, when you buy a car, you would pay it off in two or three years. The fact that people need seven or eight years is because they can't afford it. So they end up with lower monthly payments. But over the course of the entire loan, they end up paying more. But a lot of these people, when their car's out of warranty or maybe even before, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of defaults, a lot of foreclosures or repossessions. And there's going to be some big losses in the the auto lending. And of course, since the U.S. government through the Federal Reserve probably owns a lot of this paper, then the losses are going to go to taxpayers. But the bubble is not the people buying. It's the people lending. That's where the bubble is, just like in the... uh, the, the, the uh, student loan market. Although there, there, you also have a bit of a bubble on the buyer side because people are buying a degree and people believe a degree is valuable, just like people believed uh, the house would go up. People, So people actually think that they're going to make money by buying a college degree. But I think even there, you can see the bubble for the, from the buyer's perspective because no, they're not. You know, I mean, you're going to make the same money as a waiter, whether you have a philosophy degree or whether you dropped out of high school, if you're waiting tables, right? I mean, I'm not going to give uh, somebody with a degree a bigger tip than somebody that doesn't have a degree. I'm going to tip based on the service and the price of the meal. I couldn't care less whether or not my server went to college, right? So a lot of these people don't realize, hey, I'm going to go to college, but I'm not going to have a job that's any better than the people who don't go. So from that respect, you've got a bubble both in 
the buying of the degree and the financing, although now more and more of that financing is just being done directly by the government. But there is a bubble in auto finance that's clear, that's obvious, and only somebody who is you know, a paid regular shill on CNBC could look at all that evidence and dismiss it and say, nah, there's no, no signs of a real estate bubble because I don't see people buying three and four cars at a time. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? Now, also contributing to gold's weakness were statements from Janet Yellen. She gave a speech uh, this afternoon. And in my opinion, it was probably the strongest indication yet that the Federal Reserve may, in fact, raise interest rates in December. Now, she didn't commit to doing it. In fact, after she went over uh, her assessment of the economy and why, in fact, it may be ready for a rate hike, she went out of her way to state that we haven't made up our mind. She said that the committee is going to be weighing all of the data, not only the data that has already come out, but all of the data that's going to come out between now and the next time that they meet. And then it's going to base its information, uh, base its decision rather, on all that data. So, you know, while the market figures it's a lock that the Fed is going to raise rates, Janet Yellen is still saying we haven't made up our minds yet. Right. But here's what she said that indicates that that's the direction that she's leaning. Now, I've pointed out before that Janet Yellen has always stated that before she raises rates, she wants to see further improvements in the labor market and progress on her inflation goal of, you know, two percent in the medium term. And she's always defined further improvements in the labor market to mean an increase in labor force participation and uh, fewer people working part time for economic reasons, involuntary part time, meaning people who want full time jobs, but settling for part time jobs. So she wanted to see improvement on those two fronts, right? Part timers getting full time jobs and people not even in the labor market because they're discouraged coming back into the labor market because now there's, you know, all these good jobs, right? She's always said that we need that before she can raise rates. She's now changed her tune. See, here's what she said today. She said that we've had improvements in the labor market, but she still recognizes that there are a lot of people who are working part-time who want full-time jobs and who would get full-time jobs if the labor market were stronger than it is now. And she also said there are a lot of discouraged workers who have given up looking for work because they don't feel there's any jobs out there, but that if the economy improved and the labor market got better, that these disgruntled workers may realize that, hey, there are jobs here for you and they will you know, get off the bench and come back into the game. So she's recognizing that the improvements that she used to be waiting for have still not arrived. But here is what she said that was different. She said that she was confident that based on what's been happening, right, the trajectory in the economy, I don't remember her exact words, but she's confident that sometime over the next one to two years, right, over the next one to two years, we're going to get there, right? The So the labor market is not strong enough so that the, the involuntary part-timers can get full-time jobs, or that the disgruntled people can come back into the labor market, but we're going to get there. Sometime in the next year or two, it's going to happen. And she said the same thing about inflation, right? Even though inflation is not 2%, she's confident that within a year or two it will be. And there she's probably right. In fact, it it could be a lot higher than 2%. But for some reason now, all of a sudden, she thinks that there's enough momentum in the economy that we're going to get to those improvements on our own. And so somehow she could raise rates because she says she thinks the economy on its own now will get to the improvements that she's been waiting for. And she's been holding back a rate hike until we would get them. But now it's like, well, I don't actually need to see those improvements because I know they're coming. Right. But however, if she raises interest rates, maybe she'll prevent those improvements from coming. I don't know if she's ever thought about that, but here is the most ridiculous part about it. The evidence does not suggest that. All of the evidence that has come out recently, and certainly over the last six months, shows that the economy is slowing down, that the growth that we enjoyed a year or two ago is gone. And especially if you look at the labor force participation rate at the lowest point it's been, 
during the entire so-called recovery. And, and, you know, there is no evidence that it's turning around. And all the evidence suggests that it's going to get worse. In fact, if the manufacturing sector is already, already in recession, what makes Janet Yellen think the rest of the economy, the service sector, isn't going to follow suit? And if the manufacturing sector is in recession, doesn't that mean more job losses in that sector? And so if we couldn't get to the full employment last year or two years ago when the manufacturing sector was expanding, how are we going to get there when it's contracting? In fact, a couple of years ago, the talk was that manufacturing was what was going to lead us out of the recession, right? Not lead us into the next one. In fact, remember President Obama? He was talking about a manufacturing renaissance. Anybody remember that? But, you know, that's what he promised. But what he delivered is a manufacturing dark ages. I mean, that's what's actually going on. And, you know, Janet Yellen, in her talk, the only thing that seemed to worry her was overseas markets. I mean, she's acknowledging the problems that are from uh, a strong dollar on manufacturing or global demand or what's happening with lower oil prices. But all of this, she laid at the doorsteps of what's happening in Europe or China. And like everything is great in America. And the only thing we have to worry about is these overseas problems spilling over here. When the only reason it looks like everything is great in America, at least to her, is because people are worried about all these overseas problems. That is why so much money is coming to the United States. Ironically, the worst thing that can happen to the U.S. is for people to have more confidence in the overseas markets, more confidence in the European economy or the Chinese economy, because that will cause a reversal of capital flows. That'll take money out of the U.S. market. That'll cause uh, commodity prices to rise and the dollar to fall. And that will actually weaken the U.S. economy by weakening the consumer who is already basically, you know, down for the count almost. He's, you know, on the ropes here uh, looking at all of the retail sales numbers that have come out. I mean, does Janet Yellen not look at these numbers? Did she not see the earnings coming out of the retailers? Did she not see uh, the numbers for, for Black Friday? So you've got all this weakness in manufacturing. You see the consumer is weakening. Um, the service sector is going to have to roll over. And in fact, you know, those ADP jobs, again, uh, better than expected, they're almost all in the service sector. You know, they're almost all, you know, low paying. You know, ironically, too, one of the things that made Janet Yellen optimistic about the future is that she thought the government would be hiring more people. That, you know, when the economy gets a little better, the governments won't be a star for revenue. And so the governments are going to go hire more people, the state governments. And so she thinks that our salvation is going to be in more people working for government. Like that's the last thing this economy needs is to have to support more government workers. They're like parasites. I mean, I mean, how many more parasites can we take? I mean, we're as a host, you know, we're barely surviving as it is based on all the parasites that are already eating away at our body. The last thing we need is more of them. But somehow Janet Yellen looks at that as a positive development. But in any event, the stock market sold off today. Dow was down about 160 points. I don't know, maybe we're just starting to move down now that everybody is confident that the Fed is going to raise rates, although they've been confident for a while, but they've been ignoring the implications. Everybody's been very complacent. Yeah, the Fed's going to raise rates, but everything is great, right? And especially because they're telling us they're going to go slowly. But, you know, if the Fed is going to be raising rates, again, there's a very significant risk to the U.S. stock market, given how expensive it is and given the fact that all of the stock market gains have been a function of the Fed. And what the Fed giveth, the Fed can take it away. And that's exactly what Janet Yellen is threatening to do. Even if she's threatening to do it slowly, it's still taking it away. And we'll see what happens, because if the stock market does fall significantly between now and the time the Fed is supposed to raise rates, they will not do it. I mean, I am convinced that if the Fed does raise rates in December, it's only because the stock market is right near the highs and the Fed is is, you know, convinced that it'll be OK, that the stock market has blessed the rate hike. Right. They they said it's OK. But if the stock market is tanking and now I think the Fed is going to be uh, too afraid to raise rates. And here is, of course, the biggest problem for the Fed when it comes to the stock market. If they get fooled into a false sense of complacency. If the stock market is near the highs and they take that as a sign that they can raise rates with impunity as far as the market is concerned, and they do raise rates and then the market tanks, they're stuck. 
And I think that's a position they don't want to be in because if the market really starts to fall and they've just raised rates, there is no way they can stop it. And, and who knows? I mean, once the market starts to go down, who knows how much further it can fall? I mean, it can, it can go into a bear market very easily, and that would be even more evidence of an impending recession. Because not only would you have the manufacturing sector in a recession, but you would have a bear market in stocks, which would be uh, forecasting a, a recession. So that is a very dangerous predicament for the Fed to go in. You know, everybody says, well, you know, the Fed needs to raise rates now just so they can cut them during the next recession. Yeah, that would be a good argument if the next recession was years away and the Fed actually had time you know, to reload the gun right, with its ammunition. But the fact is, if they start to raise rates, this recession is going to start very quickly. It'll probably start before they get to raise them a second time. So in that respect, they look far more foolish if they have to raise rates and then immediately cut them than if they never raise them at all, because at least then they look kind of prescient where they can say, you see, we were right to wait. We weren't quite sure uh, how strong the economy is. Imagine how ridiculous they look if after waiting all this time, we want to wait for the perfect time. We're just looking at all this data and we want to make sure everything is perfect before we raise rates. And they wait years and years and years. And then just as the economy is about to implode, that's when they raise rates. I mean, how, how much more clueless can they look? How much more out of touch with reality? How much worse could their economic forecasting be if they wait till the, the, the verge of recession, right till we're teetering on the edge and then tip us over the edge themselves? Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with TruthinMedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, TruthinMedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make TruthinMedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit TruthinMedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.